Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the session. My name is Sasha. And um, the other day, I got this email with an incredible offer in my mailbox. And I read it several times, because this story just seems too good to be true. And it was from this guy who said that he was managing the bank account of the late Muammar Gaddafi of Libya. And he said, I have access to this account. It has 20 million euro in it, and the next of kin can't be found. So he asked me for some help to uh, take the money out of the bank account. And all he needed is for me to send some money in advance. So if I would just help him out with some money in advance, he would help me release $20 million, and I could have half of it for my help. And you now it seems a little dodgy, but I figured like, you know, it's worth a lot of money. So, you know, maybe I should try this. And uh, you probably already figured out that this is a scam. Uh, it's a very popular type of scam. And if I give these people the money, I will never hear from them again. They do this all the time. And uh, most of you will have had these kind of mails before, and it would have been obvious that it was, that it was uh, a scam, and that you would never get any money from them. And it's not just obvious. The idea that someone would fall for this is for people like us that go to fancy conferences like this, is often just laughable. Like, the idea that someone fall for a scam of like, send me some money and I'll give you $10 million for free. And so you might wonder like, what, kind of, what kinds of idiots fall for these kind of scams? And there's like many other types like it. Uh, there's like people who email other people and say, OK, you just email your bank account number and your PIN code, things like that. Uh, but lots of people do fall for these kind of scams, also the phishing emails full of typos. And the reason that it's sometimes hard for people like us to understand and hard to see, like, why would you fall for this, is because it's hard for us to be empathic with the different kinds of people that use technology and that get these kind of scam emails today. Because these scams are not for us. Um, so who are they for? They are for people who are more vulnerable in some way, people for whom it is harder to remember warnings about these kind of things, for people who are uh, elderly, are often targets people in poor financial situations who think this might be an escape, people with poorer memory, people who are more easily pulled into these kind of things, lonelier people, generally like all kinds of tech savvy people, but also some specific groups within that. And while these people are losing money on this, because people fall for this every single day, uh, they're basically being harmed. But to us, as people who make technology, these people are more the punchline of some jokes sometimes. We joke about these scams, because how could, you, how could you fall for this? And when I see this attitude in our community, in tech as a whole, it sometimes makes me feel a little bit like this tweet. Programming has such massive power and potential to change the world. And as a community, we're squandering it, showing the rest of the world that we aren't worthy of it. I hate it. And these are very strong words. I don't always feel this way. That would make it very unpleasant for me to do my work. And this is being a little harsh, because none of us here are personally responsible for creating these scams. But when we make products, or code, or conferences, or communities, we are not just making them for people, uh, for ourselves. We are making them for lots of other people as well. And the values that we design these things with set examples to other people and can bring joy or harm to other people. And that creates a responsibility on us to be empathic with other people's needs and situations. This is really hard, and it's also something that, in tech, we do quite poorly. And also, these are very difficult problems. Like, none of us can solve just the problem of these scams and the people that are harmed by it. We can't just solve it on our own today. But we do all have the chance to make an impact. And with this talk, I want to show some of the why and the how. So I jumped right in at the start. Not everyone knows me. Um, I'm mostly a freelance Python developer. I've been doing Python for about 10 years now. Uh, I do a lot of work currently in systems that support internet infrastructure management, but I've done kinds, a lot of kinds of things with healthcare. I used to do and still do a lot of web work with the Django web framework. Uh, I used to be a Django committer. 
I still do a lot of Django. Last year I organized DrangoCoin Europe. I'm a member of the Code of Conduct Committee still. I'm also a core team member of Write the Docs, which is a community center around documentation, communication, lots of technical writers, support people, developers, also very much, uh, with five conferences this year. And I do a lot of other things. And the best way that I've ever been insulted on the internet is when someone called me a neoliberal emotional crusader because I cared about people's well-being. Um, I also do a project together with a friend called Open Source Happiness Packets, where we try to get people to say more nice things uh, to each other in tech. So it's a simple platform to reach out to people that you appreciate or are thankful to. We've had about almost 1,000 people send nice things to each other, and some of those are public with permission. I have stickers, I have cards. Send your own happiness packet. Um, and so back to empathy. Empathy is something that that you generally already know, like it's something that you experience as part of our daily life all the time uh, when you see someone in pain, for example, physical or emotional. Uh, if you have no empathy at all, your problems are more complicated than I can fix with a talk. So for example, if, you ha if you're working with a developer and they've been staring uninterrupted at their screen for the past hour and they're just typing and that's like the only thing that's moving are their fingers, and then you might know what that's like. Uh, they're probably super focused on something. It is a poor time to ask them something that's not urgent. But also empathy is very inexact, like our perception of other people's situations, their feelings, their experiences, their emotions is uh, very incomplete, it is inaccurate. And that means we're going to make a lot of errors even when we try to do our best. But to make it worse, it's not just full of error, it's full of error in a particular direction because it's also full of bias. Um, so when we try to understand someone else's situation, uh, a lot of that comes from our own per uh, perspective and our own past. So we all have our own experiences, our memories, and the associated feelings and emotions and things we went through and that we do in our daily life. And uh, it is through those of our own that we that we're able to relate to those of others. But it also introduces a lot of bias because it means that uh, how we relate to someone else's situation is biased by the situation we're in ourselves. And the bigger the difference between these two things, uh, the more likely we become to make bad assumptions and cause confusion or sometimes even harm people. And so if my example of the developer working focus, maybe with headphones on, uh, if that's familiar to you and you work in, say, an office with different kinds of people and different kinds of jobs, you might also be familiar with people not getting it and disturbing you. And when this happens, you know, we might think like, oh, why don't these people get it? Can't they see I'm busy? Like, I just, I now have to spend 15 minutes at least getting back into my task. And, and you might think, like, surely it's obvious that I'm busy. Why are these salespeople such idiots that disrupt me in my work? And yes, it's obvious to you, maybe. It is also very easily obvious to me, because this is an experience that I share. They are similar in that behavior to me. But people who don't have this kind of work, like uh, development is a task that has this kind of work a lot, a lot of other work does not have this as much. And so for people who don't have that experience or have it a lot less, uh, they, for them it's much harder to realize what's going on. And that leads to a lot of frustration, complaint I hear from developers from time to time. But I don't think that these people are actually malicious, like the people that still disrupt you, but they do lack an experience that you have, and it makes it harder for them to empathize. Not impossible, but harder. It makes it easier to forget. Uh, it requires more effort from them than, say, from me, to empathize with that experience and, and act appropriately. Um, and this, is, this in, in a wider context, is a really common issue. And it also goes both ways all the time. Like, in this example, we are hurt by other people not understanding us. Uh, but we do this to other people all the time. Like, say, when you are uh, teaching something that you, don't, uh, that you know very well yourself, like I would be, I have 10 years of programming experience, it would be harder for me to teach someone who is entirely new how to start, because it is such a distant experience, and things are so different now. It's not impossible, I can do it. But it may be harder for me to empathize with their situation well. 
But this issue is a thing just outside of tech uh, just as much. Uh, there's a yearly holiday in the Netherlands, which is where I'm from. I live in Amsterdam. It is called Sinterklaas. This man is Sinterklaas. Uh, by definition, he is a white bearded older man. He rides the roofs of all the homes on his white horse and his helpers who all work under him, they take gifts for the children down the chimneys of the houses. And all of his helpers look like this. Uh, they all wear pitch black makeup, golden earrings, red lipstick, and clothing that relates to the colonial past of the Netherlands. This is something that's very old for me. I grew up as a child with this. And uh, the story people would tell children is like, no, like, they're not black, they are, uh, they're just dirty from the soot in the chimney, which is, this is not how people turn out if they climb down a chimney. Um, so like, I hadn't actually consciously realized how much was related to race, but then also I'm white, so this is not an experience I share as much. We're seeing more heavy protest in the Netherlands now against this. I think it will slowly change, maybe another decade, that will be totally rid of this caricature. And to me it makes sense because I listened to people who were harmed by this and, and who, for whom this is a closer experience, a more harmful experience, and then like it totally makes sense, actually. But a lot of Dutch people find it hard to understand because they say, you know, I didn't mean it in a racist way, like, this is basically uh, a white dude who owns a bunch of black people who look identical to slaves from the Dutch past. They say, ah, you know, but it's, it's not meant in a racist way, because we have no racism in our country. It's just a coincidence. It's not something to worry about. But a very important distinction is that intent, like whether or not you meant it this way, is, uh, isn't magic. Like, it can explain behavior. It cannot inherently excuse it. And there is a big difference, and it's also something I see reflected when I do community management a lot, uh, between people who are malicious, people who are being inept, who are being oblivious. Uh, there's no binary division, there's big gray areas, but uh, I do believe the distinction is useful because malicious and inept behavior happens for different reasons and also needs different approaches. So let's see this example. Hey folks, do you think it's safe to use third-party apps to integrate with PayPal? Someone else saying yes, unless you are sourcing them from China, Russia, or Nigeria. I don't consider racial stereotyping as being racist. You wouldn't be wrong to be suspicious about it. This is from a chat channel of an open source project, and I, it's a good example of maliciousness, or at least it is behavior that I think no reasonable person could argue that it is okay. It was not within the code of conduct of this space. Uh, if this is within your code of conduct, you have other things to worry about. Uh, it's just pretty messed up. I don't think any of these people thought they were acting well, that they were being inclusive, welcoming, not discriminatory standards that every community should have. I believe they didn't care, but I don't believe they didn't know. And these are the kind of people, not literally the same people, that called me a neoliberal emotional crusader in the past. Another example is this one. Uh, someone said, I bet even pro developers have good intentions. Someone else said, they are good at hiding it. Uh, this from the PSF community list. And I like this example as a good example of inept people. I don't think these people were intentionally trying to chase people away from the community, but if you are currently a Perl developer, and this is your first interaction with the Python community, it's not pretty. Um, but I think they were oblivious to the effect the language has. And of course, intent isn't magic. This is like, oh, this is like great behavior because they didn't mean it bad. Uh, but it is a difference uh, also when it comes to products you write, where how we run our communities uh, and things like that. This is also why in like Code of Conduct Management you have a big range of options from tell someone don't do this again to remove someone permanently from the community. And Codes of Conduct is something I do very, feel very strongly about having them. Uh, I'm a vocal advocate, like I don't spend time on conferences that don't have one. And my strong position is basically this. Refusing to adopt a code of conduct displays an appalling lack of even the slightest interest uh, or awareness in making people feel safe or welcome in your community. Because if people can't even be bothered to write down that harassment, exclusionary behavior, things like that are not okay, and are not willing to set up a process to handle this and make people feel okay to report this, it's basically permitting it. 
And because of my strong views about this, I sometimes end up in discussions with people, uh, and sometimes they have a lot of skepticism. And they'll say things like, ah, geez, the code of conduct is full of sexist and harassment and gender. Did people really act as savages before the last few years wave of political correctness? Isn't be kind, be polite towards other people enough? People did not act as savages before this wave of political correctness. And in an ideal world, be kind, be polite would be enough. That would be all we would need in our society. But I found consistently that when I explain more to these people and tell more stories, they usually start understanding why it's such an important thing for me. It's, although it's a starting point, it's not, it doesn't make the community solid on its own, but it's sort of the baseline a community needs to have. But I found there is a fundamental aspect of being part of a community that usually the people that say these kind of things are entirely unaware of. Uh, things that I assumed that they knew, uh, but they didn't, and that's where a lot of their initial skepticism uh, comes from. And so it was, it was obvious to me, and I assumed everyone else knew this also. And it relates to some of the examples of scams that I raised earlier, that it is also a failure of empathy, often not because people are malicious, but because they are, uh, because it's hard. And it may be something that not everyone here may have noticed either, which is that, uh, particularly in tech communities where my experience mostly comes from, things can be very different when you're part of a marginalized group, whether it's a visible way or an invisible way. Because, like I said, understanding people who are not, who are less like you, the more different they are from you, the harder it is to understand, but this disproportionately affects marginalized people and has a fundamental but easily overlooked way in the role each of us interacts with a community, the place we find in it, uh, because our empathy is so biased from our own experiences, uh, it is possible to be entirely unaware of this kind of aspects, even when you have the best intentions. And it's not a binary thing, of course. There are lots of different groups. There is a massive variation within the people inside them. Uh, and also, people in one group can entirely forget about the issues that other groups experience also. Uh, but it's not only things inside the community, it is also communities never exist in a vacuum. Nothing we do exists in a vacuum. Things that happen outside it uh, influence all the attitudes and perceptions of everyone in this building, even uh, when technically while we're inside this conference, everyone is being perfectly nice. The world outside still influences us. And for marginalized groups, things inside our community aren't always great, but outside they may actually be worse. Uh, in many ways. For example, this is a map of countries, all countries in dark red, I would face execution if I enter them, light red prison sentences, uh, the orange and yellow ones are like, eh, who knows, and the green ones are kind of okay, it's not entirely true, this map is too optimistic. These are all the countries that uh, have laws against gay, bisexual, uh, lesbian people. Uh, so, like I said, this map is way too optimistic already. Uh, the US is turning very much worse, much faster. Uh, Chechnya, I think, is over there in not a particular color, but it actually has concentration camps for gay men. And so, uh, that simple fact is, like, not being straight means that all these countries want to execute or torture or imprison me. Um, and it only looks at actual legislation, so it doesn't look like, will people beat you up in the street? It only looks at, will the government, do they have a law to imprison you? Um, and like, this map is also optimistic for me, because I'm also a trans woman, and so, uh, not so much now anymore, but I've gone through this part of using a bathroom. Uh, in the US, some states are actively working on making it illegal to use any bathroom for trans people. In Europe, you know, like we have laws, they're usually okay, but it's a bit unpredictable sometimes. For me, this is pretty easy nowadays. Um, I have friends who are struggling with this a lot more. It kind of depends, like, it depends on a lot of things, what kind of experiences you have. But I definitely also went through the phase of dehydrating myself because I didn't want to drink because I didn't know when I could access a bathroom safely. Um, and so, this is, I'm raising this example because it's exactly a kind of thing that most people have never thought about. 
if they don't have that experience. Like to most people, being in a bathroom is something entirely mundane and boring. And so that there are complications around that. It's just something that is very easy to forget or overlook. Even if you have heard about it, you can forget about it if it is not something that affects, it, affects or affected your life experience. And there are a lot of groups that experience a lot of barriers in daily life that also carry over into our community spaces uh, that other people never think of. And these are just two that affect me, but there are a lot more, and this reflects into all of our communities and all our products. Now, you might wonder why is this so relevant, because I think it's quite likely that nobody in this room believes I should be executed or tortured for sexuality or gender identity. Uh, it's a pretty safe bet. But even when everyone is being perfectly nice, it is not the same, because bad experiences don't just disappear when you enter a conference building or any other community space. It's something you always carry with you, and that can make it harder to feel welcome. It can make it harder to feel included or safe. Like, one thing I've noticed in transitioning is that I'm a lot more wary at conferences, because there's just a much higher chance that there will be an incident of some kind. And when I talk about this, it's not just for the classic groups we might think of when we say marginalized groups. Uh, when we usually talk about race or gender or some of the prime ways, sexuality sometimes, but it can also be a person who has a history with abuse. It can be much harder for them to feel safe in a space to trust other people, uh, trust certain kinds of people, even when all of them are being perfectly nice. And I saw a tweet recently that captured this well. It's a bit dark. There's nothing worse than being able to hear the hate in your own head even before anyone has had a chance to speak, when you can't escape it, even when everyone around is being nice because it's everywhere. This is pretty dark. Uh, I personally don't feel as strongly, but I'm also quite privileged in a lot of ways. Um, but I do feel it shows how often when we really want to make everyone feel included and welcome, it is not just you're not being actively harassed in this building, it needs to go beyond being nice, it needs to be winning someone's trust, because a lot of people will have had bad experiences in other tech spaces. So if you're being nice to everyone, that's great, and you should keep doing that, but as a community, uh, as developers, it doesn't mean we're done, and that applies to me as much to me as to any of you, because I may be part of some marginalized groups, but there are others, I'll bring some up later, um, that I don't understand as well either. But I do know that I have a limited understanding, but still, I'm just as much at risk myself of having bias in my own empathy. And the issues I talk about are also not something that anyone can opt out of, whether it's a situation for marginalized people specifically, or just empathy with people different from us who live in different situations. Uh, because I've heard people argue that they just want to focus on writing code so that me and my friends can fix the entire community and all the conferences. But there's no such separation, because everyone is a part of how everyone else feels in a community. Uh, and every single interaction that someone has within the community makes a difference. And this impact isn't just limited to community uh, and the social interactions we have with each other. It also affects, it reflects into the products we make as well. The things we design and that we make are affected just as much. They also set examples of values to others. They can also cause harm. And therefore, I think it's essential that we have to strive for diversity and inclusivity in every aspect. Because once we know that the more different someone is from ourselves, the harder it is for us to empathize with them, to build things that work for them, uh, whether it's a product or a community, it also means that if we build a product with a team made of pretty much identical people, it is going to empathize and work poorly for people who are different from that. Uh, and I say every aspect because it's not just race or gender, it can be health status, income situation, developers as a group are relatively very rich, uh, a lot of the world is not. Uh, it can be about housing, about education opportunities that someone had, having dependents, uh, and many other things. And that's why I also really like this hiring approach. 
I'm pushing people to think less about culture fit and more about culture add. How will a new hire add to the culture? Uh, because a lot of us, including myself, uh, are still, are, uh, or at least myself to some degree at least, we're in privileged and luxurious positions. I don't have to worry about being able to pay for my dinner tomorrow morning. It is something that does not occur to me. Uh, I don't have to think about who will take care of my children while I'm at this conference, or whether I can navigate this building when I use a wheelchair. And I do know it has a lot of stairs, but I saw some elevators. But whether it works, I don't know. But it's something I don't have to think about. It's something that, that does not affect me. And so having diverse people in your team, in your community, on the stage of a conference, and actually listening to what they tell you, also a problem often. It can give you perspectives that have never, ever occurred to you, and even if you try it very hard, you might have never thought of. Um, and as it's harder for uh, to understand someone who is less like you, it is also harder for me to understand people who do have these issues. Uh, on the other hand, I would never deliver a product which has a gender selection field that is unwelcoming to queer people or that, that has problematic options, things like that, because I know exactly how that works. I've been through that experience a thousand times. So that is something that I could never uh, mess up. But a lot of other issues uh, are just as much a risk for me. And so if we design products in a team with poor empathy, we're more likely to create products that only work for ourselves. Uh, and only for the people who are most similar to us and not understand how they feel for others. And that can have serious impacts that are difficult to recognize until things go bad. This is the driveway of a house in Potwin, Kansas. Uh, this is a broken toilet left there by uh, some unknown strangers, there was something about, they wanted to claim a debt that these people that live here knew nothing about. And also their house has been visited or searched by the FBI, by federal marshals looking for escaped convicts, by IRS collectors for people who didn't pay their taxes, uh, police officers looking for runaway children, and a lot more. These people had nothing to do with any of those cases. And at some point, the local police department actually try to get actively involved to stop this house from getting raided every time. And so what did they do to deserve that? It turns out there's a geolocation database called MaxMind. They estimate locations of IP addresses. And for about 600 million, they don't really have any more data than somewhere in the US. They don't know which state. They don't know which city. So the data just says it's in the US, no city, no state. And they give location coordinates, latitude, longitude. And for the coordinates for somewhere in the US, they picked the center of the United States and then rounded it, and that's this driveway. And at some point, a journalist got involved and discovered that it was this database that the police would query every time and say, like, oh, you know, this, this, this crime was committed from this IP address. It would, they would query the Maximine database. It would point them to this house, and so they would raid it. Uh, and so the journalist asked the uh, people from MaxMind, from the geolocation database, like, you know, like, what do you think about this? And uh, they said, yeah, didn't it occur to us that people would use the database to attempt to locate people down to a household level. We've always advertised it as a city or a zip code level. And so it did not occur to them that if people query an IP address on your website and you give them a map with a, with a marker, that people will assume that it's, that it's there. Uh, these, these people, the people that live in that house, survived, so there was also like, there was a fair chance someone could have died. If the police raised your house, people don't always survive. Um, of course, Silicon Valley is full of wonderful examples of this. I also like uh, Apple Health, manages healthcare data, and at launch it tracked things. It's now a few years old, but when it launched, it had a more limited feature set, and it tracks things like heart rate and weight, things that a lot of us might track but also less common things like cholesterol level and inhaler use. But there was something else missing, uh, which aren't just metrics for people with relatively obscure uh, situations, but something very obvious, because the entirety managed to forget that about half of the world menstruates at some point in their life. It didn't allow you to track menstrual cycles. Uh, they just released, they added it after a full year. Now they've actually added a lot of fancy features for it, but 
uh, menstruation tracking is important to a lot of people. It is a significant health indicator for a lot of people. It has been tracked longer than phones have existed. People have been tracking this for the last few thousand years. Uh, so, but yeah, they, it just didn't occur to them to include this, even though it's one of the most commonly tracked health statistics. Security is full of examples. Uh, if you dismiss threats related to local access or knowing a victim's password, spend 15 minutes with a divorce attorney in 2017. So now we're two years later. I don't think this got better. And so security design is often full of assumptions about which scenarios affect people. But my scenario is, uh, and the products that I make and how, it's affects, how, it, how the security scenarios affect them can be drastically different from those of other people in ways that aren't obvious to me. And also, there are a lot of assumptions about what the impact may be when security is compromised. Uh, Ashley Madison is a dating site marketed to people which basically cheat on their partner. They don't use this slogan anymore. Oh, you, yeah. They don't use this slogan anymore. They made something that's slightly less direct. And in 2015, all their account data was uh, breached, 32 million accounts. Um, large parts were published later, they were leaked. And maybe your first thought, like, it is a dating site for people who want to cheat on their partner. So your first thought might be, and it was mine at the time, like, you know, you kind of deserved it for deceiving your partner. Like, be monogamous or not, but don't lie to your partner. That is unethical to me. And it is not, like, you might face consequences for that. But although it was the group that the site was marketed to, uh, they weren't the only people using it as a site for discreetly finding partners. It was also used by gay people who were closeted. And so it included over a thousand accounts of men looking for other men in countries uh, where even looking for this, not even doing anything, is punishable by prison or torture or death, and they were now all exposed publicly. And there's other dynamics like people who were in abusive relationships and had their data leaked. And they're like, first thought might be like, you know, they kind of deserved it, but the impact can actually have been much greater. We don't have numbers on what the actual impact is. There's no centralized data for this. And personally, I also encounter a lot of products that don't think about trans people, not exclusively trans people, who often change their legal name and gender, as I did last year. And so I tried telling my, one of my insurance companies, they had a form on their website, enter my new name. And they said, after two days, they mailed me. They said, you have informed us of your new name, but it is not possible to change this data. Therefore, we have not processed your request. Um, so yeah, they wrote a form specifically to do this. And they said, oh, no, you, can, you can do that. And it's like, yes, I can. Like, it's a legal right in the Netherlands. Uh, so I cancelled, of course, because it was less hassle. Uh, the GDPR helps a lot with this because people really freak out when you say GDPR. So when people say things like this, you say GDPR, write your rectification, you, are, you have this many weeks to respond, and then usually they pick it up very quickly. Uh, I've also had an ISP who insisted I sign a paper to hand over my contracts to a different person. And I started explaining to them, no, no, it's, there's no different person. I am the same person. In fact, the person you had a contract with, that name no longer exists in the Netherlands. It is retroactively does not exist. And they were just like, no, no, you have to sign this. Just make up two different signatures. Uh, but we need this form. Until I said GDPR, and then they were like, OK, we changed it. Um, Lots of people can't change their legal name, trans people uh, in particular. So you also need to account for that. People might have a different name on their ID card than they use on your website. Some conferences that I've been to once uh, ask for every person on registration for their ID card. And so if you do that, you need to have a process to deal with. The name on my batch and registration is different from my ID card, or you're basically completely inaccessible. Um, this is a nice example of physical products, not the daily work for most of us, but it's a nice example still. This is an electric wheelchair, super fancy one. It can actually climb stairs like it has those, those threads, and you can go up the stairs backwards, which is a little uncomfortable already. Um, and this seems like really cool technology, because climbing stairs, uh, stairs are often an obstacle for people who use wheelchairs. And none of the people that I personally know that use wheelchairs will ever use this product because it costs 30,000 euro. 
and no one's going to pay for that. They don't have the money. Dutch health insurance will not pay 30,000 when they can also give you a 500 euro wheelchair. So this is like a nice example of like this is a cool product for a target group to help them with uh, obstacles that they do experience, which most of them will never ever be able to afford. Uh, and even if some of them are, for 30,000 euro, you could also just build a ramp. Uh, you could build a lot of ramps on a lot of stairs, and you can make it accessible to people who can't buy fancy wheelchairs, people who you have luggage even, people who use walkers, be like all kinds of people with all kinds of issues, whether like medical health uh, issues or just like convenience, like people with strollers, for example. Um, and so like this is like cool idea, but it doesn't actually help, and this, uh, this happens a lot with products that are made for disabled people that the people who make them don't actually understand what it's like, and abled people think, oh, this is such a cool idea. And so uh, the phrase you might have seen uh, before is nothing about us without us, uh, which is like, especially when you're making technology that is focused at a specific group. So it's not just like, you know, we're, we're building something and it needs to be also accessible to this group. Uh, but especially when you're targeting a group, you need to involve those people uh, if you don't have them in your team already. The team that built this wheelchair, none of them are actual wheelchair users. So they can play with their wheelchair on the stairs and see how it works, the technology, but they don't have the lived experience of using this regularly. Um, and of course, if you involve these people, you should pay them. So I would never make a product on my own for disabled people because I am not disabled. I'm going to screw it up. I don't know what that's like. Nothing about them without them. Uh, and it's the same thing like when there's like an event or something else and it's targeted at trans people, I can very quickly tell whether they involved actual trans people or whether these were not trans people talking about us. Because you see all kinds of little errors that just tell you no one of the group that we targeted this for was actually involved. I also really like this diagram uh, made by Microsoft because uh, it shows that some of our situations may be rare, but they are much more common when you consider them in a wider context, the same way that a ramp uh, can help a wheelchair user, but also a person with a stroller with heavy luggage or lots of other things. Having a product that works for people with one arm, uh, people with one arm are not super common, but it also extends to people with temporary injuries who broke their arm uh, or people who have something in their other arm so that they can't use it. Uh, if you make a product that works for people who are deaf, then it also works for people with temporary hearing issues, people in loud environments. And so there are, uh, I like this diagram because people, sometimes it's hard to convince people that we need to take into account accessibility for the people on the left because there are relatively few people in those groups. Uh, and so uh, this is also a reason why a lot of countries have legislation to force you to do this because otherwise people would be like, oh, we don't care. But when you consider the wider situation, uh, a lot of accessibility solutions actually have a very wide user group and make it uh, for people in temporary situations or uh, environments uh, that make a product uh, more accessible. Uh, when we do things like machine learning, there was a whole talk yesterday about this, which was very good. Uh, computers turn out to be incredibly efficient to replicate bias in the data we give them. Uh, and this is how we end up with face detection that only detects white people. This is how we end up with predictive policing that perpetuates discrimination, often racial and income related. Or said differently, machine learning is like money laundering for bias. And this is extra difficult because uh, also here you don't have to be a bad person when you're working on these systems. You don't have to be uh, actively racist or anything, or even passively racist. Uh, because of systemic and institutional bias, it is really easy to perpetuate uh, bias to produce harm, even when you mean to do well. Uh, an example that I like from employment and hiring, which is where machine learning is quite popular also, uh, and, and often works very poorly, like this example. After an audit of the algorithm, the screening company found that the algorithm found two factors most indicative of job performance. Their name was Jared and whether they played high school lacrosse. Uh, this is a company that 
uh, basically took the resumes of all people in their company and all people that they'd hired in the past that didn't work out, and so they asked the algorithm basically, which person, is this person most likely to, to fit in well, to like be productive here, to grow? Um, and so, of course, this uh, name Jared and playing high school across is reflective of classism, sexism, racism, and other biases that existed in their hiring. Uh, it essentially filters for white rich men. And so they had trained their algorithm to perpetuate the bias they likely already had because that's what the training data reflected, because that's how humans did the process uh, before. Uh, but especially once a computer says it, people tend to believe in it much more because computers do not inherently have bias. We placed it there. So basically, a good question to ask in general is, how are people going to abuse your product? What will happen with your product when your user is a victim of stalking? Because location data can be a fun tool for some people. For other people, it is life-threatening. And so anything that uses locations needs to be aware of location privacy and whether people know when they're st It's OK if people can post locations, but they have to know what data is going out where. Uh, if you accidentally out someone as gay through some metadata of your product, uh, that can be incredibly dangerous too, like we saw before. If you live in Norway, you know, maybe it's kind of, a, it's usually okay for a lot of people, not for everyone, but in some countries, it also threatens your life. And also, like, when it comes to machine learning, how are you preventing, perpetuating biases? Because it is so easy to fall into this trap. Uh, yesterday, there was the whole talk about that. Uh, and there are also so many more vulnerable groups where, even when we have good intentions, uh, it's very easy to cause harm to them. So, role models and representation are very important to the health of our community because a huge factor for people in believing whether or not they can do something is whether they've seen someone else do it. And the more that person is similar to them, the stronger that effect becomes. And this especially applies to people who are surrounded historically by a culture of exclusion, where they were told they can't do things, they weren't supposed to be that way, this is not a job for you, you're not supposed to be a developer, you're not a real developer because you do this and not this. And some people hear these things uh, because of gender, because they grew up in unpleasant circumstances. Some people have been through abuse, which can definitely cut down your confidence uh, a lot. And therefore, it's important that when we can, we give these people someone to prove in a way that it can still be done. And, uh, and in that way, for, for, us, for every person that can be a role model, other people that perhaps will never know, uh, they will feel more comfortable being themselves in a community. They will bring other people in when it's a good space. They will leave uh, less often. And if we get this, uh, different kinds of people in our community, that also means we can hire that culture at a lot better instead of another culture fit that is identical to what we already have. And this is why it's so important that we welcome people into our community that are not like us and actually make them feel included and at home. A way also for, to make a big impact for groups that we easily forget is to try to be someone's hero for from time to time. Uh, that seems huge, but it's not actually that hard. Um, because it is not realistic for us to represent every marginalized, every underrepresented group in every team. Uh, in, in everything that we write. There are just too many different kinds of people, and even within groups, the different intersections and past experiences are so different, you can't represent everything. It will never happen. And so, um, um, yeah, so when your team designs a product, you can be the person that says, like, hey, you know, with an hour or two of work, we can actually make this entire product. It's like it, our accessibility is very poor, but it's only an hour or two of work to make this work with screen readers. Um, or identify an issue that your product has that may affect people that other people haven't thought about. So you don't always have to be from the group to raise these kind of things. Uh, this is also why I personally try to learn a lot from other people who are in other situations than I am, particularly marginalized in other ways, because 
I might not always know the full answer for them, but s sometimes enough to be like, I think this is a little off. We should investigate this uh, because I think we have a problem here. And so in a way, amplifying voices from groups that we easily forget or that we don't have. Um, like this particular tweet. Love to everyone in my life who's actively trying to change you guys to something more inclusive. It's hard, it means a lot to me. From someone from the Python community, guys is not gender neutral, I will die on this hill. But in a way, I'd like to encourage you to make use of your privilege as an opportunity. Because most of us have privilege in at least some ways. Uh, it's a very, like, individual variance is very big. But having privilege can make it easier to overlook things, to be inept, or to be in oblivious, even when uh, you mean well. It can be entirely unintentional. But in a way, it also makes you more powerful, because it means you get away with things that other people don't. That they might accept a more aggressive tone from you, being more harsh, like, no, this is not acceptable. Um, which, like, this is one of the things, marginalized groups are often judged much harsher for the same aggression that non-marginalized people can show without being dismissed. Uh, so like privilege sometimes means that your opinion isn't dismissed so easily and makes you a more powerful hero for other people. Like for me, I'm self-employed as a developer, so people complaining to my employer and get me fired is not really a risk for me. They could complain to my clients, but I don't think they would care enough. And so just that fact on its own means I get to take more risk than some other people. Like. I have like a pretty comfortable life in a lot of ways. And so all of those things allow me to say harsher things, to be a bit more controversial, to say things that other people uh, would suffer consequences from. And so I get to get away with more. Uh, and that's why I try to use that uh, power that I get with that. Uh, privilege as a concept is, of course, not a good thing. It's not inherently OK, because you can use it for good. Uh, but as it's here and it's going to stay for a long time, we might as well try to use it for good when we can. When you're trying to be a hero for someone or from some group, uh, or you're trying to understand other people better, there is a very important skill that you need to have, which is to listen. Uh, and when it comes to this subject, there's one issue that I see the most common, particularly with marginalized people. It's the reason I don't always bother to speak up, which is when people aren't believed. When someone, I see this uh, from disabled people, for example, that we were talking about before, that people don't believe, for example, that a certain person may not be able to stand up. Because yesterday, they saw someone else who was also using a wheelchair, and they could stand up. And it's, to me, these things are bizarre. But Yes, not believing the actual lived experience of a person who has also no motivation to lie is uh, very common. It's in a more abstract concept. When someone explains how something was hurtful or exclusionary, that someone else just say, oh, well, to me that wouldn't be hurtful. Uh, I don't think that's exclusionary, so therefore it is not, and you should stay quiet. Um, or people are blamed for, for it themselves when something bad happens. Uh, and this is like, you might be surprised, maybe not everyone here, how typical it is for people to deny the experience of the people that we're actually trying to understand better. As I saw recently in a tweet, if you don't hear about your friends and colleagues' experiences with sexism, chances are they don't think it's safe to share them with you. If you think the explanation is they don't experience sexism, they are right to think so. It also means we need to make it safe to ask for help. Uh, generally, people are often reluctant to ask for help. I have another talk where I have a whole section about this. Um, but it's not just me that needs to say that. We need to make spaces where it is safe to ask for help and where people feel like it is safe to ask for help, whether that's with technological questions, with things that bother them about the community, with something they're trying to understand better, uh, with a coding problem. It can be all kinds of things. Uh, and I see often that people are dismissed, that they were dumb for not knowing something, that you know, obviously they're not proper developers if you don't know this. Um, if it relates to feelings, uh, people are told that they are oversensitive, that they are too easily offended, they shouldn't talk about this at all. And every time that happens, it makes it harder next time. So this is, uh, this is something that I feel is really important in communities because it also helps us bring new people, it also helps us bring in different kinds of people. 
but it also means that change can start small, like some of, the, some of these things that I'm talking about can seem very large and overwhelming and complex, but it doesn't always have to be a massive project. We need those too. But it can be as simple as a conference who included in their mailing. That said, we want to underline that our conference is a place where you can ask any question confidently, whoever you are. This doesn't mean that you're never going to encounter another person who is shitty about you asking a normal question. But it does mean that the organizers have set a standard for the community. They say, this is the standard. This is how we behave here. And also, if you have a particularly bad experience, it means you can probably count on their support. So not everything has to be a big project. That goes for everything I shared here. And when I wrote the abstract for the first version of this talk, that's about two years ago, I thought I was just going to uh, write a 10-point to-do list on how to be more empathic. I wrote the abstract first, then it got accepted to a conference, and I was like, oh shit, none of this works the way that I thought. Um, this, is, this is normal for talks. This is good, because you get to learn while writing your own talk. Um, but the thing is, like, it's not as simple as a 10-point to-do list, because people aren't quite so simple. And so what I've tried to do here is not just give you a simple to-do list for being an empathic person, being a supportive person, Rather, I hope that some of these stories, some of these ideas are an inspiration to think a bit more about the people who are different from you. How are you affecting them? How are you including them? How are you taking them into account? Um, and to what degree that affects what you do depends very much on, uh, on what you're actually making. Uh, but people from different backgrounds, having been through dramatically different experiences in life, to stop and think not only about how would I perceive something, how would this work for me, but also how does it affect all kinds of other people. And it can also give a nice and warm feeling. Uh, a few years ago I made what was at the time voted the best transit app for iPhone in the Netherlands, and I specifically made sure it was accessible to people using uh, screen readers and other accessibility tools that iOS has. It took like a few percent of development time. It is really quite easy for iOS, or at least it was back then. I assume it might even be better now. Uh, Apple's documentation on this also basically says, you should make your app accessible or you're basically an asshole. They use nicer words, but that's the essence of it. Um, and so this felt just like, you know, you just include this. It's, it's fairly simple. And I ended up talking to a few people who had significant visual impairments. Uh, and I, like, I didn't know that these people were there when I made the app. They weren't my primary target group, but they told me that it had a big impact on them because it was the only product that was accessible to them that gave them real-time info. Everything else was planning only, and a lot of the signs we had at the time were not readable uh, if you don't have good eyesight. Like, you don't even have to be blind. They're tiny letters. Uh, so I, it was so nice to hear that it had such an impact on these people just by doing something basic um, and to take their needs into account. And they also, of course, gave me input on like, you know, this thing is a little weird, this thing works strangely, can we change this? And I merged all those things because they were super easy to do. And it's so nice to make something that helps other people so significantly. Because for me, it was convenience to use this app. For them, it was independence or a bigger degree of independence. And so, essentially, a lot of it comes down to this. I tell my students, when you go, when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free someone else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. Uh, because we as developers, we all have some degree of power. We are a group that is... Uh, we make things that affect the lives uh, of anywhere between, let's say, hundreds at the minimum, but sometimes millions to billions of people. Uh, and that gives us the ability to make such an impact. And it is also our responsibility. Uh, we have to take responsibility for the things we help create and what they do to the world around us, to other people, to the people who are less fortunate than us. And so to make them right, not just for ourselves, but also for the great variety of people out there. Thank you very much. <laughs>